Good morning, KBC. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome to KBC. My name is Carlos Johnson, one of the deacons here. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our service. Um, to those who are watching live, good morning. Good morning to you all as well. Um, it is another day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Um, before we start, man, like I don't know if everybody got a chance to look at the partial eclipse that happened here uh, this past Monday. Um, an amazing sight to behold if you were able to get the glasses and look up and see this eclipse. Um, and it's just, it just takes me back to a place of the amazing thing that God has done in nature and creating the universe and the stars and um, there's, there's, I don't, well, granted, I think we are the only people in the universe, but like there's just amazing expanse of space um, and just being able to, I would love to one day be able to go and just look at the earth and the sun. I'll settle for the telescope <laughs> right now because I'm pretty sure I'll be doing a lot of praying as that rocket ship went up. Um, but I would love to one day be able to just go out in space and be able to view uh, God's creation from that distance and be able to see the sun and the moon and the stars up close. I think that would be an amazing, amazing thing. One day, one day. Yeah, when we, we are all together and in, 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 in heaven. Amen. Amen. All right, so if you guys wouldn't mind resting on your feet with me, stand up. We're going to praise the Lord together and have a great time in him this morning. And we'll turn it over to this team.
for your goodness, for your mercy. You knew us even in our mother's wombs. You kept us through the good times, through the bad times. And at the right time in each one of our lives, you broke our hearts of stone and gave us hearts of flesh so that we could feel your goodness, that we could taste your goodness. And the good news is that that goodness didn't stop at that point, but it continues even until this day, even until this very moment, your goodness is with us, God. Let's sing that again. Your goodness is running after. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. and in your goodness. May we continue to meditate upon how good you've been to us. Father, we, as we look over our lives, we know and we've seen your goodness, Father, and we know that what you've done in the past, you will do again in our lives, Father. No matter what situation we may find ourselves in, no matter where, where life leads us, we will trust and depend and lean into the goodness of God. Thank you, Jesus. You all may be seated. morning. morning. 
before I, I got a lot to say, so before I start talking, because I, I know I'll say like three sermons. Um, announcements. Any announcements? Yes. Good morning. Um, so the last few weeks we've been, t or last, I don't know, week or two, however long, um, does anybody, any of the kids, can you kind of tell me what book we've been talking about? Yes, David. Peter. Yeah, he's got two books. We're talking about Second Peter now. And one of the main things we've been talking about is something called false teaching. Do you guys remember that from your lesson last week? False teaching? Yeah. So um, parents, I'm going to do something with the kids real quick that's just kind of an example of a way at home to kind of continue to have more conversations about what this looks like um, and kind of get a little deeper with the kids. So you can play a little game. I know kids like games. So we're going to play a little true-false game, okay? And we're going to have the boys versus the girls, okay? So boys, you got to help each other, and the girls, you're going to help each other, okay? You're going to tell me whether it's true or false. Okay, I'm going to read a verse, and then I want, I'm going to say something, and I want you to tell me if what I say is true teaching or false teaching based on what the verse from the Bible says, okay? The first verse is Romans 3.10. It says, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. You might see a movie or hear someone say sometime that you're a good kid. You've just had some bad things happen to you, and that's maybe why you make some mistakes. Is that true teaching or false teaching based on that verse? Raise your hand. Jojo. False teaching, yeah, based on what God's word says there, yep. All right, we got another one. 1 John 4, 9. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world, that we might live through him. Now this is actually from a movie. Something they said in a movie, they said from the movie Frozen, do you remember at the very end when Anna's heart got frozen? They said, an act of true love can thaw a frozen heart. That one's a little trickier. Susie. Okay, false. Yeah, we, true love, we could say God's true love. When Jesus gave up his life, true love, that is the way that our hearts can be made new. That one was a little trickier. Some of them you got to think about. And parents, it's an example. Like, you might have to have a conversation about what, what exactly does that mean? How does that play out? Okay? One more. And this time I'm going to make it a little harder. I'm going to say it, and then I want to see if you can think of a, somewhere in the Bible that helps us know whether it's true or false. Okay? you got to tell me where in the Bible we find out. Okay? Once you can truly be yourself, you'll be happy, and you'll change the world. Eliana. Once you can truly be yourself, you need Jesus' help to be truly happy. Okay, do you know where in the Bible it says that? Okay. The verse that I found was Psalm 16, verse 11. You make known to me the path of life in your presence. Okay. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So, parents, this is just one example of maybe a way you can kind of make it a fun little game. So, I think, I think it is actually tied. Boys got one, girls got one, and there was kind of one in between. <laughs> All right, so that's just an example, parents. That's something you can kind of do maybe on your way home, just here and there, kind of make a fun little game out of it. Um, I have a couple um, work handouts for today. Um, you're going to have, um, for the older kids, you'll have to pay pretty close attention for this one. It's not just words to listen for. It's actually concepts, like something he's going to say you're going to have to listen to. Um, and I'll need a couple helpers. I don't think we handed out lanyards, so I'll need a couple helpers for this. And then one final reminder, after service today, we're having the lunch, appreciation luncheon and the orientation for anybody who's helped, volunte volunteered, discussion question leaders, nursery, that kind of stuff. Right after church will be taco bar. Um, and then nursery is open if, you know, kids need a quiet minute, you're welcome. And it doesn't have to be like babies at any age can have a quiet minute up there. Um, and also today, Anna normally does these announcements. So uh, second Sunday, 
Um, it, if we have time in the sermon, we'll have discussion questions afterwards in the separate groups. Thank you. Any other announcements? Okay. Well, we will go ahead and dive in. Um, but first, I want to open up with a uh, word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we Father, my prayer this morning is that you would clear our minds, clear our hearts, clear the last week's worries from our minds today, clear the things that might have caused us hurt or stress or anxiety or worry this week, this morning. Let a spirit of forgiveness to come into our hearts if we've, we're at odds with anyone this week and it's still on our mind. Because these are things that Satan throws at us to keep us from hearing the scriptures. personal preferences over, over what one wants or one doesn't want can get in the way, God. Allow us to rise above what Satan is trying to do to us this morning. I pray for myself. That I speak your word how you would want it to be communicated, God. Jesus name. Amen. This morning um I would say out of all the sermons that I've preached here I've preached a lot of sermons since going all the way back to 2013. And this sermon to today impacted me just a little differently. I think it's something that, and I'm not trying to like sound like super deep or anything like that. Like I'm, I really, I really believe like this is something that we need to be reminded of. And we have the faithful witness of the apostle Peter doing what he said he was going to do. He says, my aim is to stir you up by way of reminder. Here we are thousands of years later, and he's still reminding us. I'll be coming from 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to 16. And I'll be reading from the ESV. And it reads, you know, this morning, if we all could just stand along with Brother, uh, Brother Bob and Sister Sheila, just let's all just stand this morning with them as we read the scriptures. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as the righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passions and despise authority. 
Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as the wage of their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. You all may be seated. Um... If we all could, just if it, I, I want to say something, is that I, I want to make sure that everybody hears this this morning. So, like, if we could just keep distractions to a minimum this morning, please. If anyone, if you hear anyone kind of just talking a little bit too loud, please just tell them to bring it down just a little bit. Because I want to make sure everybody hears this. And I want to make sure that you are hearing the scriptures and you're not having to also wrestle with frustration at the same time. Or wrestle with things that may, call, that may catch you off guard. So please, I want everybody to be able to hear this this morning. I think a lot of times in the church we forget that a judgment is coming. I think we forget in our modern day context. Because it's not comfortable to say that God hates sin. It doesn't feel good to say that God is going to judge the world. It's not comfortable, it's not acceptable to say that God dramatically eradicates evil. And that is how he moves. We, we, we speak of, and also that is not different than his love. That is actually an extension of his love. I was talking with some brothers a couple weeks ago, and we were just talking about a situation in which a person um, hurt a child. And as fathers, we were like, there's no question. Like, I'm going to defend and protect my child no matter what it requires. I'm just, I'm sorry. Like, where, like I, I told her, I was like, man, I'm going to have to just, me and the Lord just got to have a conversation on that one. <laughs> But it's because of my love for my son. It's because I see what he cannot protect and I see what I can. There's a hatred of anything that tries to come upon my son or my wife and try to harm them. There is a, there have been a few situations where I've almost made a fool of myself because somebody disrespected Krista. And I had to say something. There have been, <laughs> it's funny, when, we, when Josiah started going to public school and he interacted with a bully, I never wanted to fight a kid in my life. I was like, I would go show this eight-year-old a piece. Like <laughs> but I didn't. But it was the natural instinct in me, though. Oh, you're hurting my son. You got to be dealt with. That's just a natural parental instinct. It's a natural instinct. You want to see Krista mad? Say something about me or say something about Josiah. You will see Mama Bear come out. And I'm not saying that to say, ooh, don't mess with them. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that's the natural instinct when you are married to somebody or you're in relationship with somebody, even your friends. My best friend. If somebody, if, he, if I walk into the room and he's fighting, I'm going to go help him, and then I'll ask questions later. Because that's my friend. I want to I help him. I want to protect him. I want to keep him safe. There's a hatred for anything that tries to harm the people that I love. And that's good. That's a good thing to have. That's not wrong. It's a good thing to have a desire to protect those that you love. And so here's the thing. God has that same desire towards us. He has that desire to protect us from anything that would harm us. Sin, 
false teaching, evil, whatever it is, anything that is set to harm us, God gets angry about that. And he gets very angry about that. And he doesn't hide his anger about that. Many false teachers have come into the church and were teaching what was called destructive viewpoints, as mentioned in verse 1. We aren't necessarily told what the specific viewpoints are being said, but at the very least, they were viewpoints that were denying Jesus himself. They were denying him as Lord and Master. They were destructive to the gospel, probably also to the fellowship of the saints, destructive to one's own soul and body, and so destructive that they denied him as Lord. Whatever it was, and I want to go all the way back to the beginning of of 2 Peter. Whatever it was, it made Peter feel the need to remind us of who we are. Brothers and sisters, the first thing that Peter starts his letter off with, and just as a quick recap, is that we are children of the divine nature. What does that mean? We are born of God. So first and foremost, who you are, you are born of God. You still got the body that was given to you by your parents, but something spiritual took place, and now you come from God now. You are born of him. And because we are born born of God and we have his nature, what does that mean? That means we are to act like him. We are to act like God. We are to live like God. So whatever the viewpoints were, they were leading the children of God into a path that led them to act in ways that were against who they were made to be. As Brother John said in the beginning, the whole point of Peter is to remind us that we were made in the image of God. And the image of God means more than just that we were beautifully made. It is also a reminder of how we are to carry ourselves. The image of God goes deeper than just how we look. It's deeper than just telling others that they can love who they are because they were made in God's image. But also we are to follow the way of God. We are to follow his way. What he would do, we are to do. All of us are to essentially be small gods upon the earth. We are to demonstrate what it would be like if God was the parents to our children. Because he is. We are to demonstrate if God worked at our particular places of employment. How would he work that job? We are to demonstrate if God were to live the very specific life that we live, liking the things that we do with the interests, personality, and character that we have, what would it look like if God fully embodied my life that I live? That's what we are called to do. For me, what would it look like if God lived the life of a black man born in inner city, Kansas City, raised by a single mother, father lived outside the home, a product of urban culture with an affinity for the arts, music, and creativity, but also as a pastor, a full-time employee, father, son, brother, neighbor. What would that life look like if God embodied all of that? That is what we are called to do. Whatever heresies were being taught, they were telling people that it's okay to call God Father and also not act like who he is. It's more than just a title when we call God Father, but literally that we come from him, just like we come from our earthly parents. He is our Father. He says in 1 Peter 1.17, if you call him Father when you pray to God who judges all people by the same standard, According to what each one has done, so then spend the rest of your lives here on earth in reverence for him. How do you live in reverence for him? You remind yourself, for you know what was paid to set you free. If I bought y'all, if I bought you a Bugatti, one of the most expensive cars on the market, you would take care of that car. You would take care of it so much you will even avoid going to certain parts of town. Because you don't even want to risk the chance of that car getting messed up. How disrespectful would it be for me to give you a Bugatti and then the next day you go and wreck it? Or you get it scratched up or the bumper's falling off? That would be very disrespectful. That would, that's a million dollar car. <laughs> So 
So what you have been bought with was not something that could be destroyed, as Peter says. He says, for you know what has been paid to set you free from the worthless. It's, the manner of life outside of Christ is worthless, brothers and sisters. From the worthless manner of life handed down by your ancestors, it was not something that can be destroyed such as silver or gold. It was the costly sacrifice of Christ who was like a lamb without defect or flaw. So if you're treating your Christian walk flippantly, the first question I need to ask is, what do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about his death? Do you believe that his life was valuable, that it surpassed anything that money can buy? Do you believe that essentially you've been given that Bugatti spiritually? So why are you treating your Christian life intentionally going into places where you know if I go over here, I'm going to fall into sin? But you intentionally go over there. If I intentionally run with this thought, it's going to be sinful. But you choose to do it because at the end of the day, you like it. You love it still. You still love sin. That's why we do it, brothers and sisters. It's because we don't have a big enough hatred for it. And I think Peter is going to say some things that in my life, it stirred up some more hatred for sin in my life. It made me step back and say, hey, I don't hate these things enough, Lord. I need you to give me a bigger hatred. And I'm going to tell you, he gave it to me. As I look over the things that I struggle with, God's like, the reason why I hate it is because how it hurts you. Even if you don't realize it's hurting you, sin is always hurting you. Even if it feels good, brothers and sisters, it's always hurting you. It is not something to play with. It is not something to treat flippantly. Here's the thing. You have the creator of the universe. The creator of all of this, he simply speaks and all of this comes into being. And he says, hey, when you come up against sexual immorality, don't even try fighting it. Run from it. So do you know how evil sexual immorality has to be for the creator to tell you to run from it? He said, don't even worry about putting up the fight. Get out of there. Do what Joseph did. He looked at Potiphar's wife, didn't even worry about his clothes and ran. I think he's probably like the only successful story of somebody averting sexual morality in the scriptures next to Christ. Everybody else, if you stay around sexual morality, you're going to fall. Long enough, you're going to fall. Run from it. And that's with any other sin, brothers and sisters. He tells you when you come up against these things, when you come up against these behaviors, kill it. And we're going to read a story that serves as an example. As Peter begins to contradict this viewpoint that these false teachers are saying you can claim to be a Christian and not act like God, he knows that it's attractive to his people because his congregation is suffering. They are suffering because of the lives they have to give up in order to follow Jesus. These people have lost jobs, they've lost homes, family, friends, their sanity, their safety. So a doctrine that's creeping into the church that's saying, hey, guess what? You know what? You can actually follow Jesus and still keep doing what you're doing. That probably would have sounded like a breath of fresh air. Oh, you mean to tell me, like, I don't really have to lose my job and I can still follow Jesus? You mean I, can, I don't really have to escape Jerusalem? I can still follow Jesus and still carry out the Mosaic law at the same time? But as long as I say I'm following Jesus, I'm good. These false teachers knew, oh, I can say the right thing. They're suffering. They've lost everything. They've had to move away. Imagine having to, um, ha having to leave Kansas City and go move over to, I don't know, Knoxville, Tennessee. Sorry for anybody from Knoxville, Tennessee. And you have to start over because you were forced out of Kansas City because of safety and you've lost everything. And the life that you're having to rebuild isn't quite comparable to the life that you just that you had to leave. This is these were people's everyday reality in the ancient world. 
And I think we've been spoiled a bit because we don't have to experience a lot of that in our context. We don't necessarily live in a world where you get persecuted because you say you're a Christian. At most, people will be like, oh, you're one of those Christians. That's about as as much persecution as we're going to get. So far. But Peter is saying, not so. Live like you are. This is how you know you are saved. When you aim to live like our Father. We may not get it perfect. But the aim of your heart, whether you fail or succeed at it, the aim in your heart is that in everything I want to be like my father. Is that the aim of your heart? And here's the thing. Don't let your heart deceive you in telling you yes and you're not living like him. Really examine your life. Is the aim of your heart, is the goal of your heart, is that in everything, not just in here on Sunday morning, doing your Christian duty and all the ministries that you signed up for, is the aim of your heart to live like God in everything. Not in some things, not just in things that are related to the church, but in how you argue with your spouse, how you have disagreements with your children, how you work at your job, how you interact with your neighbors, how you think about and talk to yourself. I had to repent to God of that. Some things that I tell myself are not things that he tells me. I remember I was, I was beating myself up about something earlier this week, and God was like, do I talk to you like that? And I was like, no, you don't actually. He's like, who does that sound like? Sounds like Satan. Exactly. Nothing but accusations. God said, even if you did sin, I have forgiven your sin, and I've forgotten it as far as the east is from the west. I am not bringing your sin back up. Who is bringing your sin back up? It's that old, it's that old serpent bringing it back up. He is constantly after you, brothers and sisters. That man does not sleep. I don't know if we can call him a man. That being does not sleep. Don't take Satan lightly. Like, don't take him lightly. I feel like we take him too lightly in our modern-day context. The Scripture says he roams to and fro throughout the earth, never-ending. He doesn't give up. He is co- One thing I can say about Satan, that man is committed to whatever lie he believes. And he is going to see it through all the way to his destruction. I always say, like, I think Satan has deceived, he has deceived himself so much, he still probably thinks he has a shot. <laughs> it's like, no, brother, you got defeated at the cross. This is, we're just waiting for the time, we're just waiting for the, uh, the breath to leave your body right now. You already got the death blow. The Christian walk is accepting that we will never get it right, but we don't stop there, brothers and sisters. But it is also the rejecting of the lie that I give up pursuing righteousness. See, there's this teaching that's crept into the church today, right? Everybody is going to therapy. Everybody's checking into their emotions and all that. I'm not saying therapy is wrong. I've been going to therapy for a long time. I, I, I treat it like a, like a yearly checkup, right? I go often just to make sure, hey, am I thinking about this right? Am I thinking about this in the right way? But here's the thing. Here is the thing. Yes, we accept that we will never get it right. And many of us have been given a Christianity in which you have to get every, there is no room for error, no room for mistake. But here's the thing. You could take that teaching to the far left and think, well, this is just my lot in life and I'm just going to sit here. No, brothers and sisters, you also need to reject the lie that you have to give up pursuing righteousness. Yeah, you're never going to get it right, but that don't mean you stop pursuing it. You're going to get it right a lot of times, actually. We actually need to give credit to the Holy Spirit that's living in us. He's going to do what he wants to do. and He's going to do it perfectly. And yes, we're going to sin and mess up. But blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. If we weren't supposed to pursue righteousness, Jesus would have never said that. He would have just said, blessed are those that accept their lot in life. No, he says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. If you are hungry for something, what are you going to do? I'm going to go find some food. If I'm thirsty, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go find some water. If I don't have it at my house, I'm going to leave my house and go find it somewhere else. If I can't find it anywhere else, I'm going to call a friend. Hey, what y'all got cooking? Because I'm hungry. 
So when you're hungry and thirsty for something, what do you do? You get up and go look for it. You get up and go pursue it. So if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, that means you are getting up and you are pursuing after righteousness. Because you're hungry and thirsty for it. If you're not pursuing after righteousness, are you hungry and thirsty for righteousness? If you are okay with the sins in your life, are you hungry and thirsty for righteousness? I get it. You've been struggling with sin all of your life. You've been struggling with particular sins longer than you want. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness, brothers and sisters? Are you passionate about getting evil out of your lives? You can be free. You can. It is yours for the taking. A lot of times we stay bound to sin because if we're honest with ourselves because we don't want to admit it, we love it still. Even as believers, we still love it. We still want to stay around it. We still want to be like Lot. He told us to flee Sodom, but I'm going to camp out just outside the gates, though. He told us to get rid of all anger and malice and bitterness, but I'm going to say, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind every now and then. I may not yell, but I may still say some disrespectful things. I may not yell, but I'm going to send you a text message. I may not yell at you, but I'll send you an email. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness, brothers and sisters? Get evil all the way out of your life. Peter reminds his people, another reason why you don't act like the world is because you have escaped it. Because of this, make every effort to walk in the divine DNA that you've been given. You are not from this world. You have been placed into the divine family. The divine last name has been given to you. And not only that, you are to keep increasing in your understanding that you've escaped this world. We have escaped this world, brothers and sisters. John chapter 15, verse 18 and 20 says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were in the world, the world would love its own. But because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You're never going to be totally comfortable in this world as a Christian. And if you are seeking to be relevant to this world, you are not pursuing after Jesus. If you are seeking to take the gospel and make it more palatable, right? The gospel is a beautiful message. It is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful message. Full. It is the demonstration of God's love towards us. But also at the same time, part of the gospel and the reason why Christ had to die the gruesome death that he did is because God hates sin. He hates it so much that he put the punishment onto himself. He made himself a spectacle to the world. He allowed himself to be beaten so much so you could not make out who he was. He allowed his beard to be ripped. It's a gruesome picture, but it is a picture that reminds us of how God hates evil. This is what he's, he wants. He, what you see on the cross is what God does to evil. He destroys it. Every ounce of it. There's a reason why those nations in the Old Testament don't exist anymore. It's not just because... They just got old and quit. It's because God did what he said he was going to do. He said he was going to eradicate their memory from the earth. That's why you only read about them now. And I know when we hear about the violence of the Old Testament, we're like, how could a loving God do this? How could a loving God not do that? That's my question. You have to understand, these nations were set against the people of God, and they wanted to kill and eradicate the people of God. God said, you are not going to touch my children, so I'm going to X you off of the face of the earth. I'm going to destroy you. Those nations represented more than just nations. They represented evil upon the earth. Here's the thing, until we are able to speak a word and things just automatically take shape, until I'm to say, human, appear in front of me, until that is able to happen, we need to sit up here, we need to probably pause our judgments of God, whether he's right or wrong, with the violence in the Old Testament. 
I start off with God is good. And if he is good, that means he hates everything that is not good. And just like I have the natural parental instinct to want to eradicate and destroy anything that hurts those that I love, God has that same desire within himself. He wants to protect you. Do you understand that? And it grieves. The reason why the Holy Spirit is grieved when we go back to sin, because God is like, I'm trying to protect you from that. And you're running back into its arms. Do you see what I did on the cross? Because of that little white lie you want to tell on your job report. You want to fudge the numbers a little bit to give you that extra promotion. Or because of the things that you say and in, in when you're angry to those that you love. Or because of the selfishness and the pride or because of the lust, you keep running back into it. And God is saying, do you see me on the cross? That sin did that to me. I allowed that sin to do that to me, to disfigure me, to beat me, to spit upon me, to mock me, to kill me. And you keep running back to it. It does not like you. It may feel good. It may give the the temptation that it feels good. It may feel good in the moment, but it's not. Here's the thing. After the sin is done, the truth comes out. That's when, when the conviction and the guilt and the shame and the anxiety and the worry and all of that set in. God's like, that is what the sin wanted to give you. What it did was it dangled the fruit of vindication. It dangled the fruit of pleasure. It dangled the fruit of power. It dangled the fruit of control, and you took it and went after it. And once you ate it, it disappeared in your hand, and all you had left was guilt, shame, and condemnation. Sin is a deception, brothers and sisters. It is not something that has your best interest in mind, even though it feels amazing, or even though it feels like I got that off my chest, I said what I wanted to say, I did what I wanted to do, and a few minutes later, a few moments later, you're wondering, man, how far did I get? Why why do I feel so far away from God? A few moments later, why do I feel like God doesn't love me? Because that sin led you deeper into the wilderness. It led you off the path. Any of us ever been hiking and got lost off the path? That is a scary moment. I was hiking in Colorado s- several years ago, and there was an old path that was done, that was like they closed off. So they made a new path, which was safer. But they forgot to remove one particular sign. So I saw the sign. I was like, oh, we go this way. And I was like, man, this path is like rough to walk <laughs> through. Like, why is it so rough? And next thing you know, I'm like, I have no idea where I'm at. I'm in the middle of the Rocky Mountain Range, lost. I was 16 years old, terrified. The only thing that got me back was looking at the signs, following the signs that I saw, and asking a few hikers, hey, how do you get back to the path? Perfect example of the Christian walk. There was a deceiving, there was a deception on the path that took me off the path. And I got so far off the path that I'm like, I no longer feel safe. I feel exposed to the elements. If a mountain lion come out here, I have nothing to protect myself. I'm just food for this mountain lion. Natural selection has won. Because I I can't fight a mountain lion out, you know. You know, some guys, they're like, you know, I could fight a bear. No, you can't. You can't. (laughs) You can't. Women, like, on guys' nights, that's the type of stuff we talk about on guys' nights. Like, man, you think you could fight a bear? You know, I could take one, you know, if I could just come at it from this angle. No, you can't. You cannot fight anything with four legs, okay? They're faster than you. I'm scared of my little Yorkie when she get a little bit too, too hype. I'm like, oh, okay, it's your world. It's your world. This is your house. She has no teeth, but she still will nip at me sometimes. But I got off the path, and I was scared. But once I got back on the path, safety returned. Peace returned. Clarity returned. I knew where to go. 
Brothers and sisters, that's, that's, the, that's the Christian walk. That's all these scriptures. This is just your signpost, brothers and sisters. That's why Peter says pay attention to these scriptures because it's like a light shining in the darkness. Brothers and sisters, at this church at least, if you don't believe this, you're going to have a hard time at this church. At this church, we believe these are the inspired word of God. And the reason why we believe this is the inspired word of God is because of what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, I saw Jesus. He was real. He really did what he said he was going to do. He really raised people from the dead. I saw him transform. I heard the voice from heaven say, this is my son. So if he was real, that means that all of these scriptures that speak of him are real. If you don't believe these scriptures, then what do you believe about Jesus? Because if Jesus, if you believe Jesus was real, these scriptures talk about him. So that means these scriptures didn't lie if Jesus is real. So that means these scriptures are trustworthy. And so this is our signpost. It's not about the book in and of itself, brothers and sisters. It's not about just the bonded leather and all the gold pages. It's not about that. It's about the testimonies that are contained within these pages. That these were real people that experienced the real God. The prophet Balaam, we're going to talk about him a little bit in the, in the future. The prophet Balaam said something so powerful, false prophet, actually, but he actually said something so powerful. He was pronouncing a blessing over Israel, and he says, I see somebody in the distance. I can't make out who he is, but God is saying that person is going to come and destroy evil. But I can't really make out who it is. The whole point of Jesus' coming is to destroy evil, but we keep running back to it. You keep running back to the very thing that Christ came to destroy. Brother Carlos last week preached about false teaching, false teachers, and how to notice them. You'll hear a lot, for those of you who may not know what this word means, you'll hear some Christians say this word heresy, right? Heresy, all it simply means is contradicting viewpoint. That's it. This contradicting viewpoint, opposing viewpoint. There is a viewpoint as established in this book that we agree. We look for the consistent viewpoint from Genesis to Revelation. What is the consistent viewpoint about God? What has everybody believed about God in history? And that is where we line up with. Okay, everybody believed this about God, so it's probably Right. Like, let me fall in line with this because this is the testimony I see here in this book. Everybody in this book believed this about him. Everybody in this book didn't, be, didn't believe these things about God. So let me reject these things. So whenever you hear somebody say heresy, it's because they are considering this book. And they're saying, ah, that doesn't quite line up with what is said here. It's not necessary that that person's trying to come at you and say that you're wrong. It's just that, hey. Let's just go back through these pages real quick, and let's just make sure it lines up. And so what Peter is saying is they will bring in destructive heresies, meaning they're preaching viewpoints that are contradictory to these pages. They are preaching viewpoints that are destructive to, this, to these pages, that are destructive to our life, that are destructive to who God is. Indulging of the flesh, denying him as Lord, denying him as master. And Brother Carlos preached upon that last week, and he left off, and he says their destruction is not asleep. And so Peter begins walking, looking back to the Old Testament stories. He says, when we talk about violence in the Old Testament, a lot of times in our modern context, because we want to make it feel more comfortable for us, we'll say things like, oh, well, they were, it was just hyperbole. God didn't really kill everybody. It was just hyperbole. It was just an exaggeration. Or is this an allegory? For life. Those stories didn't really happen. It was just an allegory for life. It was just a fable, right? Aesop's fable. Remember those fables we, we, we learned about in school? It's not the, the gospel is not the tortoise and the hare, brothers and sisters. It is not the tortoise and the hare. It is not a mantra that you just say over and over until you feel good about yourself. The gospel is a true story because. It is about a real person that walked the face of this earth, and it's about a real person that is ruling and reigning in the spiritual dimension right now. 
And he is standing before the Father, performing, doing, sitting at the right hand of the throne, making intercession for us. We believe that to be real. If you don't believe that to be real, you're not believing the gospel. Now, it's a difference between totally rejecting it and just struggling with some elements. That's different. And so with the violence in the Old Testament, Peter presents a different perspective. Don't worry. Don't, we need to get out of this conversation of was God right in doing what he did? Was he right in that? This is, this is my answer to that. God is, and I'm going to use some scientific language. This is just how it helped me understand. God is a being of infinite dimensions. We, are, we, we, we exist in a, in, a, in a set of rules in which the world makes sense. Height, length, and depth. That's how we understand the world. That's how we see things. That's how we could tell if something is real, if it fits these rules. But God is outside of these rules. And so if we, try to, if we look at the Old Testament and we try to fit God into our rules, absolutely, it makes no sense. But when you have a being that not only is he seeing everything that's playing out in Scripture, I mean playing out in history, but you also have a being that knows the intentions of everybody's heart. And not only does he know the intentions of everybody's heart, he knows what type of person they will grow up to be. He knows their future. So if God destroyed a nation in the scriptures, he probably had a good reason why he did it. But we want to get hung up on that, and we miss what we sung on the song this morning. But for us, his people, destruction is not chasing after us. Goodness is chasing after us. The reason why God eradicated those nations in the scripture is because they were trying to eradicate his people. And if he didn't, if he, if he didn't stop, it, it, it wasn't just one generation. If one generation would pass off, their children would grow up and want to kill, after, kill the people. Here, here's the message of that, though. It's, it, it's, it was a real situation that happened. But it also serves an example for us, which means sin does not stop pursuing you. Don't ever think that sin is going to take a break. That's why some of us, we've been struggling with some of the same sins since we've been, since we were young. Because it hasn't stopped. Look at your own life. Evil does not stop pursuing you. Satan does not take a break. Don't ever think you will get to a place where you stop struggling with a particular sin. Because when you get to that place, Satan's like, great, his guard's down. Let's go in for the kill. You, here's the thing. As a Christian, you just got to accept the fact that you are going to be on the run from sin all your life. Sin is never going to stop pursuing you. I told, a friend, I told a friend last night, man, I probably got sins I ain't even experienced yet waiting on me down the road. There are things that I probably have not even struggled with that are waiting for me. They're wanting to cut me off at the pass. And as the Israelites were walking through the wilderness, God is saying, the Amalekites, they want to kill you. We got to get rid of them because they want to kill you. And their children will grow up to want to kill you. And their kids' kids will want to grow up to kill you. Also, when you eradicate this nation, don't worry about taking their spoils. Don't bring their gods into our camp because their gods want to kill you. Okay, you went a little bit further. The Moabites want to kill you now, so we got to get rid of them. And their children's children's children will want to kill you. Don't take their spoil. Don't take their women. Don't take any of that. Leave it all to destruction. But what did we see in the scripture? Israel was like, yeah, we killed off the people, but you know what? We'll take a few wives for ourselves. We'll take a few idols for ourselves. Some of us, we've gotten sin out of our life. We've gotten the obvious parts of sin out of our life, but we still flirt with the temptations. I may not look at pornography, but I'm always looking, wondering, do I still got it, though? 
Hmm? I may have crushed a, an addiction to gambling, but I still got this greed in my heart. I may have crushed this sin, but I still flirt around things that are close to it. Brothers and sisters, if the scripture, if God calls something evil, eradicate it from your life. The scripture says that they were fought, the false teachers were following the way of Balaam. Balaam, not, we don't have time because it takes about three or four chapters in Numbers. But the story of Balaam was this. The Moabites were terrified of the Israelites. Did you know you can make the kingdom of Satan like terrified of you? By remaining faithful to the way of Jesus, like Satan will be scared of you. The evil nations around Israel were terrified. They're like, these little people are coming through, killing everybody. So the king of, 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 the, of the Midianites went to Balaam and said, I need you to pronounce a curse over them so they don't kill us. Balaam said, cool, here's, here's my fee for that. He was a prophet for hire. Basically, he would take money and just say whatever the people wanted, wanted him to say. So he really wasn't a prophet at the end of the day. But God knew what was going on, so God intercepts and says, no, you're going to say what I tell you to say. Terrifies Balaam. Balaam says, I can't go against that man over there. I have to say what he tells me to say. Every time Balaam opened his mouth, nothing but blessing came out. The way of Balaam, though, what is it? These false teachers will infiltrate because they're greedy for gain. Everything about Balaam was greedy for not just money, but also the Midianites. The king said, if you do this, I will give you honor in my kingdom. Balaam wanted that worldly renown, that fame. Oh, I get honored by the king? So that means more money's going to come in. That means I'm going to get more people to pay me for my services. Some of us, if, if we own businesses, we know the temptation. I've, I own one for a short period of time. We know the temptation of wanting to go around a sinful way to make more money. As a business owner, it's always, it's always that ethical dilemma of how much, what, what do I do until it becomes a point where it's unethical for me now? He opens up his mouth and nothing but blessing comes out. But here's that story in Balaam. So in about Numbers 25, God is, Balaam eventually, before we get there, Balaam eventually finds another way to get after the children of Israel. And we don't really see it in Numbers. We don't really hear about the reason until Revelation, actually, when Jesus actually says what Balaam was doing. Balaam, was, he found another way. He couldn't get them through cursing them, but he did get them through enticing them to commit adultery with, uh, with the other nation's wives and their idols. He got them to engage in sexual morality and worship false idols. So God at this point has had enough of Balaam. So God tells the, uh, he tells the, he tells the priest, he says, take everybody that followed Balaam. And this is a, I'm going to say this because this, this is how serious God takes sins. Take everybody that followed Balaam and impale them on poles in front of everybody. As he was saying this, a group of Israelites came in boasting about taking Midianite wives for themselves. Phineas takes a spear and thrusts it into the stomach of the wives and the man that brought them. See, here's the thing. We don't talk about this type of stuff over the pulpit, though. Oh, it's too bloody. This is the God that we serve. The reason is because... It was evil. What Balaam was doing to the people was evil. Do you care more about making somebody comfortable or do you hate evil? It's not necessarily about was God right or wrong. God was right whether you want to agree with it or not. I don't care if you agree with it. God was right in what he did because he's God. And who am I to fix my lips to say that God was wrong about something? I could never fix my lips. You could never fix your lips to say that God was wrong about something. 
He says that to Job. Who disturbs my counsel? Prepare yourself like a man and answer these questions. Are you able to walk down the, on the floors of the deep ocean? Are you able to play with whales and, and rhinoceros and elephants like they're puppies? Do you know when the eagle gives birth on the high mountain? Have you ever seen the deer search for food? Have you ever brought them their food? Do you know where the snow, where the snow is stored? Do you know where the rain and hail comes from? When you know this, then you can fix your lips to say something to me. Brothers and sisters, we are not God. We don't know any of those things. So what does this Balaam story teach us? God seriously hates evil. It breaks his heart when his people run back into evil. Just read the prophets, brothers and sisters. The prophets, it's less about Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and it's about God communicating his heart through them. He's like, y'all have forsaken your first love. I remember when we used to dance, when we used to be one, when we used to be united, when we used to be connected with each other, and now you've gone over to them? You're worshiping me in the temple, and you got an idol set up right next to the altar? You're praying to me and praying to pagan gods at the same time? You know that I love you when you take care of the orphan, the widow, and the prisoner, and now y'all are oppressing them? You want to go back to Egypt? Guess what? I'm going to let Egypt take you. Brothers and sisters, some of y'all are struggling with sins because God has said you kept going back to it, so I'm going to give it over to you, and I'm going to let you struggle. I'm going to let that guilt and that shame settle in on you. I'm going to let the weight of that sin rest upon your shoulders until you get to a point where you say, God, I don't like this anymore. Some of us, gods, we not gonna, some of us, we're not going to get free from stuff until we have the same hatred for it that God has. And you will continue to struggle with sin until you hate your sin just as much as God has, because the whole point of Peter is living like our father. You cannot live like your father and love sin at the same time. That's not godliness. If you want to be godly, you have to hate your sin. And if you believe that you have no sin, the scripture says you are a liar, and the truth is not in you, and you got to deal with that. I know this is a heavy and weighty message. As the praise team would come. But just as much as God knows how to destroy evil, he also knows how to rescue the righteous. The Old Testament isn't just about his violence. The Old Testament is also about him rescuing his people. Yes, he destroyed the entire ancient world, but he also rescued the righteous. Here's the thing. Anybody that was destroyed in Scripture was of evil. There is nobody that was righteous in Scripture that was destroyed. Nobody that was righteous was destroyed. And here's the thing. You fix your lips and say, how could God do that? So why do you advocate for the punishment of sinners in our world? Why do you advocate for evil people to be punished? Why do you advocate for certain sins? You may even advocate for the death penalty. Because you recognize, even in your own heart, even if you don't believe, there is something inside of you that says evil must be dealt with. There is something inside all of us that says evil must be destroyed. And here's the thing, brothers and sisters. We are in the ark of Jesus. Just like he rescued Noah, he rescued us. Destruction is coming to this world. But here's the beautiful thing. We ain't going to face it. We are not going to face it, brothers and sisters. Here's the thing. In order for God to be a God of justice, he has to punish evil. He has to. Just like, just like our own justice system. If our justice system did not punish evil, which it often does not, if it doesn't punish evil, guess what happens? People don't trust the justice system. 
we begin to make a mockery of the justice system. It is for the fame of God's name that he punishes evil. He will not be mocked. No man will be able to stand in his court with an accusation. God says, listen, I understand those stories are hard to hear and hard to stomach and hard to deal with. But if you knew what I knew. See, many of us, we don't want to concede the fact that we don't know everything. God said, if you knew what I knew, you would do the same thing. Just like he destroyed Sodom, but he rescued Lot. And here's the beautiful thing about that story with Lot. Lot was a man of confliction. On the outside, it looked like Lot was really struggling with letting go of sin. But we see in Peter, Peter says something about Lot. He says, but internally, that man was tormented in his soul day and night with what he saw and what he heard. That's why when Abraham was walking with God down to down to Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, "Okay, like he was basically showing us if there are righteous people here, would do you rescue the righteous? Abraham didn't didn't have no issue with Sodom getting destroyed. Actually, he was like, but if if they're you going to destroy righteous people, too. What if they're like 10 righteous people? What would you do? What if they're like 20 righteous people? 30 righteous people. The whole point of that discourse was to show that God rescues the righteous. Brothers and sisters, if you're worried about destruction, you don't have to worry about it because you have been made righteous in Jesus Christ. You are righteous. You will be protected. You will be preserved. And here's the thing. If you are struggling in a sin, it's just for a little while. Just like when when the Lord sent the Israelites into captivity, into Babylon. When he sent them into captivity, it was just for a little bit of time. He already knew, I'm going to send you here, but I'm also going to bring you back out. Brothers and sisters, if you're struggling with something, you, you, you will get free. He will rescue you. He can rescue you today, actually. Matter of fact, I heard a pastor say, God got a weak, God got a soft spot when his children cry. That's the most natural parental response. When your children cry, you got a soft spot. Now, some of us daddies, we may be a little bit harsh on, we may be a little bit too hard with our words, but there's still this concern, though. You go to their aid. You see if they're okay. He has come to our aid in Jesus. If you have need of the communion elements. Please raise your hand. And so, brothers and sisters, false teachers, they will rise from within your midst. The scripture says from within your midst. Very rarely is somebody going to bust through these doors just declaring false doctrine out into the open air. It's very rare that that's going to happen. More often than not, it's somebody that we know and the reason why I can so easily come in because, and I'm not saying, I'm just using an example, Todd wouldn't say anything that to hurt, hurt me. I'm not, I'm not saying you're a false teacher or anything. <laughs> so you know what, let me, let me pay attention. Because I love, I love him, he wouldn't, he wouldn't say anything to hurt me. That's how Satan gets into the church. He gets in through somebody's desire for greed and fame and control and notoriety then they elevate to a position of influence in the church. It may not be preaching, but it may be having little conversations, spreading little things. This is why we do things like church discipline, brothers and sisters. It is the most uncomfortable thing that you have to do as a pastor. It is the hardest thing that a pastor has to do. I take no joy in having any disciplinary conversations. It is the most anxiety-ridden thing for me. But as a pastor, I have a responsibility. We can't let evil reside in this church. Like if you are not acting, here's the thing. Brothers and I'm just let you know. If you're not acting like Jesus and we have came to you time and time and time and time again. Hey, you're not acting like Jesus. Here's the way. Here's the path. At a certain point, brothers and sisters, we have to, we have, I have to follow what the scripture says. Jesus himself says, treat them like a Gentile and tax collector, meaning give them over to what they want to do. 
If that's what you want to do, go do it. But you can't be in covenant with us. You can't call yourself a child of God and live like a child of Satan. There is a distinction here. So, brothers and sisters, what does this have to do with you? What are some things that you can take away? Take inventory today. Take inventory of your life. How are you allowing evil to remain in your life? What can you do to get evil out of your life? You are saved. Yes, that's, that, that is finished. But just because you are saved does not mean that sin and temptation stop. Where are the cracks? Where, where is the leaks getting in? Plaster them up. The scripture, the, one thing, the, the way Jesus was described was zeal for your house will consume me. The zeal for God's house. God's house is your body now. Your body is the temple of God. Do you have zeal for where God is residing? Are you constantly putting in front of your eyes things that God detests because he resides in you? So as you look upon something, you're making God look upon that same thing. The words that you are saying, God is, part, is, is hearing and feeling those same words. He's feeling those same emotions. Does zeal for his house consume you? Does zeal for your body consume you because he resides in you? He is with you. Do you have zeal for somebody else's body? Zeal enough to the point where you will call them out and say, hey, you are going after something that is killing you. Even though it feels good, it is killing you. It is worthless. Will you be like Phineas? No questions asked. Sin is dealt with immediately. Brothers and sometimes we try to analyze sins too much. Well, is this because, you know, I grew up this way? Is this because this is how my house is? Is this, it's sin at the end of the day. Um, when you figure out where it came from, and I'm not saying that that's wrong. I do it too. I figure out, like, why do I deal with this? Why do I struggle with it? But at the end of the day, it's still sin, brothers and sisters. Get it out. I'm going to tell you this here. One time I was up here, and I said something. I said, sin serves us. That's wrong. Serves us in no way, shape, or form. My point in that was that every time we sin, we have a moment of opportunity to go back and figure out what led me to that. Probably should have just said that. But when I said that, didn't go off pretty well. And I'm not saying, like, to point out anybody. I'm saying I'm, I'm being humble enough before y'all. That was something wrong to say in the pulpit. So I walked back with the Lord. I said, all right, Lord, take me back through these scriptures. What's up? And he's like, all it is is having the same testimony from Genesis to Revelation. Don't nobody ever has ever in their life said sin serves them. Sin is something you got to get up out of you. Sin is something that you got to run from. I don't care how little it is. I don't care how big it is. Get it out of your life. Because God is, don't camp next to something God is about to destroy. If you knew a missile was coming to this building at 7 o'clock tonight, I'm not going to be here at 6.30. I'm not going to be here at 6.59 watching is the missile coming. I'm gone. I'm at home. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, you have been saved from sin, but also get sin up out of your life. And I know that was a long sermon, but I'm sorry. I just had, to, had, to, had a lot to say. I told you I had a lot to say. Um, if you need uh, communion elements, I actually need a need an element. Let's prepare. Oh, you got okay. Appreciate it. When we take this communion, we remind ourselves. I want to don't shrink back from the violence of the cross. The violence of the cross was intentional. Jesus knew everything that was, he knew every whip he was going to take. He knew every beating, every punch, every smack, every spit. He knew everything that was going to happen. He allowed it to, it was planned. He entered into that willingly. But he entered into that to demonstrate the monstrosity of sin. Sin, when you read Revelation, sin is not a cute little thing. Sin is a beast. If you read Daniel, sin is a multi-headed beast. It is akin to a dragon. You see dragons, you see panthers, you see leopards in the Bible. What is this? That's what sin really is, brothers and sisters. 
If you were able to pull back and see the spiritual reality of what you're dealing with, you would run from it. Maybe trust that God has a vantage point on something that we just don't see. When we think, oh, I'm in my bedroom and the lights are off and everybody's asleep and nobody is watching me. I think I'm just looking at something on my phone or you're looking at something on your computer. You pull back the spiritual lens and it's a whole beast you're dealing with. You're at work. You know what? I'm doing this report. Let me put a little extra little decimal point here. I'm doing my performance review. Let me increase this little recap a bit just to make myself look a little better. But you pull back the spiritual curtain, lying and deception. It's a whole beast of lying and deception you're dealing with. And here's the thing. In some of these mo- in our modern evangelical spaces, we don't talk about the spiritual reality enough. Now, I come from a world where that's all we talk about. Everything is spiritual. And you know what? We got a lot we can learn from our Pentecostal brothers and sisters when it comes to how they see that spiritual world. So the monstrosity of sin is what caused the violence of the cross. It broke his body. The thing that you're dealing with and struggling with is the reason why Christ had to die. The God that you serve, the Lord that you love, the reason why he had to die is because of that thing you do not want to let go of because you can't imagine a life without it or you don't like the discomfort you feel when you go without it. Or you don't like the discomfort you feel when you're called to having to die to yourself and bite your tongue or check your emotions, check your desires. Like Peter says, do you know how much it costs to save you? Live the rest of your life in thankfulness for that. He says, this is my body. Some scriptures say that was given for you. Some, or some translations say it was given for you. Other, some translations say that was broken for you. As he broke the bread, it signified his body being broken for us. He says, every time that you eat this bread to do in remembrance of me, let us take and let us eat. The drink, it doesn't represent juice. It represents blood. How do you see somebody's blood? They have to get hurt. If blood is being poured out, that means that that person is dying. Jesus is basically saying, I have to die in order for you to be one with me again. Yeah, somebody had to die for you. Think about how much you would honor a friend. If you were getting, let's say, robbed at gunpoint, and that friend came up and stood in front of you in the bullet and took that bullet for you and they died, think about how much you would honor that person for the rest of your life. You would make sure their family's taken care of, you would probably have pictures and T-shirts of them. Like you would, uh, you would celebrate their birthday. You would, even, you would make up a holiday to celebrate them. You would celebrate them for the rest of your life because they saved your life. But with Jesus, it's like, ah, I know you died, but I'm going to go do this sin over here. Are you really thankful for your salvation? He says, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant that was shed for you. Take and drink. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, he says, to do in remembrance of me. Remember the violence of the cross, brothers and sisters, as you leave here. So when that temptation raises his head, remind yourself, my God was dismembered, disfigured. He was killed because of this. This has no place in my life. This has no place in the temple of God. Stand with us if you can as we sing this final song.
walking in this place. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. I worship. 
take that for granted. We don't take this opportunity of being in your presence for granted, of, of knowing who you are, of knowing your word, of knowing the truth of the gospel for granted. But Father, we truly worship you in spirit and in truth because we understand that our lives have been changed, that we have been transformed for, this, for your sake and for the kingdom's sake. Father, we pray that as uh, we continue throughout the rest of this day, may the words that we have heard through, you, through your preached word impact our lives. May we not take that for granted, but may we truly be changed to change lives, not only our own, but others for the sake of your gospel, for the sake of your word, for the sake of your kingdom. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You all are dismissed.